And um, then thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. This is an amazing turnout. Um, I see all these people, all these names, uh, friends of the community. It's so good to see you all. It is great to know that we have so many people across Massachusetts who are committed to passing the Safe Communities Act. Immigrant families really can't wait anymore. I've been working with the immigrant community for the last 18 years. I'm an immigrant myself. I was undocumented for over 22 years. So I know what a relief it is to be able to see people who care for us. So thank you. We can't wait anymore. We, keep, we need your help. So thank you for doing that. We're, tonight, we're gonna hear from a very diverse group of people, all immigrants or advocates working directly with immigrant communities. And we encourage you to use the chat to share your support for the speakers and your own reasons for fighting for the Safe Communities Act. If you are on camera, and we are sorry that we, that we can't have you all, you can also either pump your fist, you know, snap your fingers, or maybe give us a, a, an applause visibly. Um, we call this a town hall, but this is a rally too. Please show our, speak, our speakers lots of love and support. If you're on Twitter, please like tweet using the hashtag Safe Communities Act. And if you are on Facebook Live, please share the event on your feed and keep sending love and commenting on the chat. Our first speaker is Amy Grunder of Mira Coalition, who will give us a quick reminder of what the Safe Communities Act will do. Welcome, Amy. Thanks, Damaris. I, I hope everyone can see me okay. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. It's great to have everyone with us tonight. I'm just gonna do a brief rundown on the bill for those of you who want a refresher. And if you have questions about anything that I say, just drop them into the chat and we'll do our best to answer them either during or after the program. There's also, there should be a link to the fact sheet um, dropped right into the chat momentarily. And I guess I'll start with an update right now. The bill is in the Public Safety Committee with an extension until July 15th. We had some delaying events this session, first a snowstorm and then a pandemic. But we do uh, have a lot of support on that committee and we're optimistic that the bill will get a favorable recommendation for passage this year. If it does, it will likely move to ways and means and we hope to the floor for a vote. So what is this bill? The bill would basically is, is quite simple in its intent. The bill is, will, would end the involvement of police, courts and sheriffs in deportations. That's the goal of the bill. It would do it by creating clear guidelines for law enforcement, and it also protects basic rights for people who are in custody or detention. And, and I'd add that it builds on an earlier bill that was filed by Senator Eldridge, one of our lead sponsors, in 2013 and 2015 called the Trust Act, and is in fact similar to dozens of trust acts that are enforced in many of our cities and towns across the state. What this bill does is it generalizes the best practices that are already enforced in many of our cities and towns so that they protect everyone in the state. It has four key provisions and each one targets a law enforcement practice that undermines community trust. So first, it prohibits police and courts from questioning people about their immigration status. Immigration status is irrelevant for public safety work and asking these questions actually undermines public safety. Sorry undermines public safety because it stops immigrants from reporting crimes and exploitation or seeking protection of the courts. I got, I got um, something came across my screen just then, sorry about that. Second, the bill stop, stops police and court officials from alerting ICE when someone is about to be released from police or court custody. So for example, someone might be arrested, say, for driving without a license, and they're about to be released on bail or with an order to go to traffic court. Now, ICE already knows that they've been arrested because of a federal program called Secure Communities, not to be confused with our bill, that states do not have the jurisdiction to prevent. But we can prevent court officials and police officers from giving ICE the heads up. Right now, ICE can't make arrests in our courts because of a temporary court injunction, but this rule would apply to all law enforcement and would give the injunction the force of law. The third provision of the bill protects people's basic rights 
ICE agents regularly visit correctional facilities and jails to identify people for deportation. Often they question people without identifying themselves or the purpose of the interview. So people have no idea that they're talking to an ICE agent or that their words can be used to deport them. We've even heard of people signing their own deportation orders without knowing what they were. So this provision would require law enforcement to get something called informed consent before any ICE interview using a standard form in multiple languages that explains the purpose of the interview and alerts people that they have the right to refuse it or to have their attorney present, kind of like a Miranda warning. The forms would be preserved as public records that advocates could then monitor. And this policy, I'd add, has been very successful in other jurisdictions. It turns out that when people, that when people know their rights, they exercise them. So fourth and final, the bill would ban uh, something called 287G agreements. These agreements are the most extreme form of collaboration with ICE. They allow ICE to deputize local officials with federal immigration powers. They get access to the ICE database. They decide complicated legal questions of deportability with a mere eight weeks or so of training and they are given the power to question people and place them in deportation proceedings. And I might add, this is all done on our dime because federal law prohibits using federal money for it. So I wanna give a shout out here. I'm not sure if Representative Tony Cabral is with us. This is Representative Tony Cabral of New Bedford, but he's been fighting for years to defund these agreements and is the personal enemy of Sheriff Hodgson. So um, I wanna thank and give a shout out to Representative Cabral. I think we're almost at time. So I just wanted to just do a quick poll in the chat, uh, right in the chat, how many, I wanted to ask what you think. Um, and just, just, I want volunteers here. There are six states in New England. How many states in New England have a 287G agreement? It's Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Anybody? We're looking in the chat here. Any, any guesses? Six states, how many? One, two, three, one. What is that one state? Those of you who are saying one. Massachusetts, that's right. So Massachusetts is the only state in New England to have a 287G agreement. Here's another question for you. Um, one, more, one more poll. Um, there, Massachusetts is one of three states in the United States whose Department of Corrections has a 287G agreement with ICE. What are the other two states? What are the other two states in the country besides Massachusetts? <laughs> Anyone? Someone's got Arizona. Someone's asking Texas. So the, the two states are, the people who said Arizona are right. It's Arizona and Georgia. So I just want you to think for a second about, you know, does, does anyone besides me think that this is incompatible with Massachusetts values? I'm just saying. So, so congratulations, congratulations everyone for your test. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dominice. Thanks, Dominice. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for that info too at the end. Um, and for that reason, uh, I'm very happy and pleased to introduce our ne next speakers. Next we're gonna hear from our three lead legislative sponsors we're going to start with uh, Senator Jamie Eldridge. Welcome, Senator, and thank you for your leadership in this issue. Great. Thank you so much, Demarice, and uh, thank you to Amy Grunder for the summary of the bill. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people on this Safety Can't Wait Safe Communities Act virtual town hall. I'm seeing that over 230 people are watching uh, tonight's town hall, so thank you for being part of this. And um, I know that the House uh, sponsor will be, will be speaking, Representative Liz Miranda, Representative Ruth Balzer. I know that Senator Sal DiDomenico and Representative Paul Tucker are, are on the, the Zoom call tonight. And I, I serve as the lead sponsor of the Safe Communities Act. And you, know, you heard about uh, the details of the bill from Amy. And I really want to emphasize because, you know, I think sometimes there's a sense that, you know, this bill um, wouldn't somehow protect immigrants or doesn't play a role. And, and I would really say nothing could be further from the truth. And I, I wanna tell some specific stories from my district. Um, I represent a Metro West district uh, that has uh, arguably one of the largest uh, Brazilian uh, communities, not only in the entire state, but in the entire country, uh, as well as significant uh, Central American, Indian, uh, and Chinese uh, populations. And you know, about four years ago, um, and I still remember it to this day because I, I can't get out of my head. Um, sitting in my district office with a, a mother and her daughter, 
um, where the, the husband had been uh, deported uh, by ICE uh, back to Brazil. And um, that, that father um, did not know about uh, his rights to you know, refuse an ICE interview or to seek an attorney. And so um, he was uh, picked up by ICE and put on a plane back to Brazil, no exaggeration, in just three weeks. Um, and to this day, his daughter, uh, who's now just about 12 years old, goes to Brazil to visit him every year. But that, that's just an outrage. And um, you know, this bill uh, would have provided more information uh, to that gentleman about what his rights were. Uh, just a few, few years ago in the city of Marlboro, there was another family uh, where uh, the husband uh, went to court uh, to uh, follow up on a, a very uh, minor motor vehicle altercation. Um, ICE agents were at the courthouse. This is before the prohibition in the courthouse uh, for ICE agents. Uh, and they picked up uh, the father as he was leaving you know, the courthouse. And despite uh, many months of opposition and you know, assistance with attorneys, um, he, was, he was also uh, sent back to, to Brazil. And I still see the family today in, in Marlboro. And, and look, when you lose a parent, when you lose a loved one, um, that they you know, go back to, to another country, um, you know, it, it's not the same. And, and, they're, and they're still really struggling. So, you know, the, the provision um, that would prohibit uh, court personnel uh, and police officers from responding to ICE, in my opinion, would, would have helped because I think, unfortunately, probably a court uh, officer at that courthouse had informed ICE uh, that the gentleman was in, at that courthouse. And, and I know that the, the theme for today is, is the focus on um, it's so urgent. And, you know, I, I see immigrant families, many of whom are, are, you know, laid off now. They don't get unemployment. They don't get uh, CARES Act funding. So they're feeling even more vulnerable. So this bill is even more necessary right now. So um, really appreciate everyone uh, coming in. We really got to get this bill out of committee. And I'm honored uh, to be here with uh, fellow lead sponsors. Thanks everyone for uh, watching tonight and uh, honored to advocate with you on behalf of immigrants across the state. Thank you very much, Senator, and we are very proud and happy to have you among all of us. Um, now, please welcome Representative Ruth Balser, who has been an invaluable uh, leader to this campaign um, on the House side. Thank you so much, Representative, for being here and for your support. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with 245 amazing people who want nothing more than to make Massachusetts a safe and welcoming home for immigrants and refugees. I'm so, so glad to be here. And I'm here to give you two pieces of very good news. The and we need some good news, right? <laughs> We've been going through some tough times. But the good news is that the Joint Committee on Public Safety voted to extend this bill to July 15th. Now, some people might not realize that's good news, but it is good news because it means the 245 people on this call, as well as all of your friends and neighbors, can now call every rep and each of your own reps and senators, but also every member of the Joint Committee of Public Safety and say, now is the time for the Safe Communities Act. And while you're at it, if you're on the email, hit copy and hit the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. It wouldn't hurt to tell them that the time is now for the Safe Communities Act. And the second piece of good news, believe it or not, comes from the United States Supreme Court. Not only have they given hope to the dreamers, but they also gave us hope, those of us who are fighting for the Safe Communities Act, because they refused to even take the case that was challenging the law in California that was the basis for our law here in Massachusetts. The so-called sanctuary law in California, the, the court ruled that the federal government cannot require the states or municipalities to enforce federal immigration law. And when the US Supreme Court refused to even take the case, they were agreeing with the lower court. 
So when you call the members of the Joint Committee on Public Safety, tell them that the United States Supreme Court has ruled we are under no obligation as a state or as a city or town in Massachusetts to do the work of ICE. Quite the contrary, we are well within our rights to be Massachusetts and to stand for what Massachusetts stands for, which is protection of the rights of all the residents of the Commonwealth. And we're gonna together, we're gonna pass this bill this session and make sure that Massachusetts is a safe and welcoming home to all immigrants and refugees. Thanks all for being here tonight. Thank you, Representative uh, Bowser for those good news. And I think that now is a good time to either clap or you can snap your fingers. Let's just celebrate, you know? Those are good news and you're right, we do need them big time. And thanks for your support and your leadership. Um, I'm also very excited to introduce our next um, speaker. Let's welcome Representative Liz Miranda, who's only her, on her first term in the House, but has already emerged as a leader in so many important issues, including immigrants' rights. Welcome, Representative Miranda. Hey, thank you. I hope you guys can hear me well. Um, Ruth, that was like amazing. Uh, my colleague in the house there brought down the house um, and it's been an honor and a pleasure to really work with her um, and Senator Eldridge and many of the colleagues that I see posting here in um, the chat room. I, I want to start off by saying that when I joined the State House um, in January 2018, there was only one Black woman in the State House and uh, one person of mixed heritage, which is our Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. And I felt strongly that a daughter and the granddaughter of immigrants, um, when I walked into the halls of the State House and the chamber for the first time, I had known that at that moment that I had realized a dream that many women of color will never realize and had never realized. I think there's been about a dozen black women who have ever served in that capacity and Latina women. I knew that I was carrying with me um, this history of living in a community that was um, largely immigrant here in Roxbury and Dorchester, that my great grandfather had come to this country in the early 1900s uh, aboard a whaling ship not a whaling ship, a, a, a boat, and came to work on uh, the cranberry bogs. And like many Cape Verdean immigrants, we came in different waves. And that was the first and second wave. And then um, in the 70s, most of my family came after uh, a revolutionary war. And what's important about that is that I wanted to share that when I go to the State House, uh, now not with COVID, I'm not there often. Um, but when I enter that building, I know the enormous privilege, yet the responsibility to speak for the, the tens of thousands of immigrants, regardless if they come from Haiti or Vietnam or from Brazil or from Cabo Verde uh, or the Caribbean islands or Africa or the other European nations that they, in Central America and all these great places, that they come to this country to realize a dream. And that dream is being inhibited uh, by really structural racism. And our history of policing in this country is not one that has been positive and one that has actually elevated immigrants. Almost every ethnic group that has come to this country has had a challenge with the dominant class. Um, the Safe Communities Bill was my first bill that I said that I would champion. And I am not stopping because I believe that immigrant justice is racial justice. If we are talking about Black Lives Matter right now, we need to be pressuring our colleagues and people on Beacon Hill, the governor, our mayors and our town managers to realize that immigrants are black and brown people too. They are the people that have been um, pushed and not respected and not given the same equal opportunity and protection under the law. And so I wanna say that I am with you now, I was with you then, and I am constantly speaking about the fact that we cannot let fear win, we cannot let hate win, we cannot let injustice win, and um, I am 
sort of the token of that to see me in the state house. I've been a legislator for 16 months, but I've been a black woman my entire life from an immigrant family. And I understand deeply the pain um, that our laws are causing. Massachusetts seems like a blue state to a lot of people, but it's not a very blue state and progressive state when it comes to criminal justice. And we have to keep fighting. So um, good luck to us all, buena suerte. Uh, people think I'm Dominican all the time. Um, and just wanna say to everyone that you are my brothers and sisters in this fight. And we have a powerful voice. If we unite um, black and brown communities across the Commonwealth, we will be heard. And we wanna continue to press the message that um, we deserve equal opportunity and protection. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Representative Miranda. You know, I, I, I can't see all of you right now, but I really hope that you are either clapping and snapping your fingers or sending messages because this is great. Um, the three of you are really amazing leaders and we're very proud and happy to have the three of you on board. And I know that we have so many other ones too, but uh, um, thank you so much. All of you are an inspiration. Um, so now, uh, please welcome Gladys Vega, Executive Director of the Chelsea Collaborative. If you paid any attention to all uh, that is happening to COVID-19 crisis, um, and I know that you all have, you've seen the extraordinary work that Gladys <laughs> are doing in Chelsea, which has a COVID infection rate that is five times the stage average. Gladys is an incredible community leader Thank you so much, Gladys, for, for uh, joining us tonight. And I think- Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I apologize, I'm walking around just because we are having our food pantry happening today. So I have all these um, boxes that are being given out. I just wanna highlight that during this pandemic, the humanitarian aspect of the people came through by, um, yes guys, the boxers, um, las están haciendo. Um, so it, ca it came through the humanitarian um, way of compassion, love, but that has to remain in order for us to pass bills in Massachusetts that respect and prioritize immigrant, undocumented immigrants. I think that the Safe Communities Act represents all these people that we have here that are not having access to many resources because at the same time they are afraid of reporting of being tested. Many people were um, very afraid of being tested because they were undocumented. And at the time of the pandemic, these are the, the individuals that are not getting resources and the pandemic spread highly in a community as Chelsea because people were afraid because they don't have a safe community. And although they have the Chelsea Collaborative, we don't have policies in place that demonstrate the immigrant communities matter in Massachusetts, other than their taxes. Um, I feel that when this whole pandemic happened, I felt like it wasn't, it wasn't fair because many times we are good to pay taxes, right? To have IT numbers, but we are not good, good to get the dignity and respect that we need as a community. So I am delighted that we're pushing this bill more than ever and I really wish that all the people that have contributed to the Chelsea Collaborative through donations, all those people that live in Newton, Brooklyn, everywhere that they have come with boxes of food, that they also understand the importance that they play in a legislative way, that we need them to make sure that they stand in solidarity with our immigrant families past COVID-19, that they continue to support us in policies, that they're unconditional love is not only on the pandemic, but that is in the, law, uh, in the halls of the state house lobbying for our interests. That's what I wish that this whole pandemic can translate to. That if once we are over with all these concerns, that people really, really step up and understand and acknowledge that without immigration or, or general policies that make you feel welcome, that make you feel that you're not just a stranger, that you're just, humanity came through for the COVID-19 crisis. Let's keep it going. Let's give unconditional love to people. Let's welcome Massachusetts, anyone, and let's take care of our people regardless of where we come from. So I really 
urge people to continue to, um, to keep an eye on that and, 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 and to realize that in the 32 years that I've been at the Chelsea Collaborative, Massachusetts has not done anything for our immigrant community in terms of state policies, in terms of the driver's license bill, the Safe Community Act. It's time for us to step up and, and, and not um, be afraid to step in solidarity with our immigrant families, lobby and, and pass this legislation, take the, the bill out of committee, and let's make this policy happen for the benefit of the people in the Commonwealth that got the COVID-19 because they were the first responder, because they were the service workers that were doing the job that normally not everyone is able to do or doesn't want to do. So that's what I want to add. Thank you so much, Gladys, and thank you so much for showing us the work that you're already doing and you keep on doing. You never stop. Someone uh, wrote that on the chat and it is true. Uh, you keep on going. Thank you so much for doing that. And actually, you know, your words are perfect for uh, because to action that I want to do right now because you're absolutely right. This is the time for us to put pressure so Safe Communities Act can pass and we can pass many other bills that can support our immigrant community. So I wanna invite you all to keep live tweeting and sharing on Facebook. Uh, use the link on your stream um, to tweet uh, a, call to, uh, a call to action with the picture you see above. And if you don't see it, then again, we're putting it right on the uh, uh, chat. Um, so you can share it with your friends. Let's call on friends. Let's make sure that they are part of it. Let's invite them. Because as um, the panelists have been saying, now is the time. We cannot wait anymore. And we don't have to face another crisis like this to realize the importance of making Massachusetts a welcoming state. So um, thank you, um, Gladys. And I'm uh, very uh, proud and happy to introduce another Gladys, our next speaker. This is Gladys Ortiz. Uh, of Reach Beyond Domestic Violence, who will be introducing two speakers from immigrant communities. So welcome, Gladys Ortiz. It's wonderful seeing so many people supporting the immigrant community. Life, life has been very difficult. In, in, in my work offline, I can see this in the day-by-day -day, um, activities that I perform with, with, with survivors of domestic violence and the community and who better to tell the stories that, 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 that themselves. So right now, I'm going to ask Sandy. Sandy is one of our uh, speakers today. Sandy, oh, yeah. we've been having some uh, <laughs> today, I'm sorry. You know, this is our new reality, so we know <laughs> how to deal with technology. Oh, and yes, that, you know, uh, we all understand. So um, we're going to move on, and um, we're going to have a musical break which is perfect too. Uh, we're gonna welcome Rafael Medina. I saw him somewhere at the beginning of, uh, of the meeting, so I know he's somewhere there. Rafael Medina, he's gonna sing. There you are, good. So he's gonna sing a beautiful and beloved song about immigration. It's called No Me Llames Extranjero. Don't call me a foreigner. We've put a link to a translation of the lyrics in the chat too. Okay, welcome, Rafael. Gracias. Okay, so this song, Don't Call Me Foreigner, No Me Llames Extranjero, de Rafael Amor, and hoping that one day we get the point, we wake up enough everywhere, and we don't have to have sanctuary cities anymore, and we realize that we're all sisters and brothers from the same mother earth, therefore, nobody's a foreigner, and we all have the same rights. So here we are celebrating that. llames extranjero porque haya nacido lejos porque tengo otro nombre la tierra de donde vengo no me llames extranjero porque fue distinto el seno porque acuno mi infancia otro idioma de los cuentos no me llames extranjero si en el amor de una madre tuvimos la misma luz en el canto y en el beso con que no sueñan iguales las madres contra su pecho. No me llames extranjero, ni pienses de dónde vengo, mejor saber dónde vamos, a dónde nos lleva el tiempo. No me llames extranjero, 
porque tu pan y tu fuego calman mi sed y mi hambre y me cobija tu techo no me llames extranjero tu trigo es como mi trigo tu mano como la mía tu fuego como mi fuego y el hambre no avisa nunca vive cambiando de dueño Y me llamas extranjero porque me trajo un camino, porque nací en otro pueblo, porque conozco otros mares y algún día zarpé de otro puerto. Si siempre quedan iguales los adioses en los pañuelos y las pupilas borrosas de los que dejamos lejos, los amigos que nos nombran, son iguales los rezos y el amor de la que sueña con el día del regreso. No, no me llames extranjero, tenemos el mismo grito, el mismo cansancio viejo que viene arrastrando el hombre desde el fondo de los tiempos, cuando no existían fronteras, antes que vinieran ellos, los que mienten, los que roban, los que matan y destruyen nuestros sueños, ellos son, ellos son los que inventaron esa palabra extranjero. No me llames extranjero, que es una palabra triste, es una palabra helada, vuelo vivo y a destierro. No me llames extranjero, mira tu niño y el mío, como corren de la mano hasta el final del sendero. No los llames extranjeros, ellos no saben de idiomas, de límites ni banderas. Míralos, se van al cielo. Con una risa paloma que los reúne en el vuelo. No me llames extranjero, piensa en tu hermano y el mío, el cuerpo lleno de balas, besando de muerte el suelo. Esos no eran extranjeros, se conocían de siempre. Por la libertad eterna, igual de libres murieron. No me llames extranjero, mírame bien a los ojos. Mucho más allá del odio. De... So I, I was always so quiet. I never spoke up about the situation because I was so scared that they were going to call ICE and that my family was going to be separated and they were going to take away my mom because my mom at the time was undocumented. And, um, but I just want the safe communities act to, to take possibility, take action, and actually let these people and let our immigrants feel safe in their community, not only in Waltham, Chelsea, Providence, wherever, like we want Massachusetts to be known as that place where we give protection to our immigrants. And I think that that's something that we should always take in mind and um, take an action and something that should be heard and our immigrants should, voices should be heard. And I just wanted to thank you guys for this great opportunity and I hope and um, stand together and I hope that this Safe Communities Act can pass by. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tandy. Muchas Thank gracias. You. Thanks for Thank being brave enough to share your story. Thank you. Gracias. Um, do we have Andres ready? Sí, me, me escucho. Sí. Yes. Ah, bueno, yo, yo simplemente quería eh, dar mi opinión. Yo he tenido dos experiencias muy muy graves por acá y debido a un día llamaron la policía eh, a los ocho días vino emigración por mí y, y hace en diciembre tuve un incidente muy grave estuve Andrés, un momentito para traducir un, eh, eh, simultáneamente haga pausitas ok Oh, okay. so, yeah, yeah, so he said, yeah, yeah. So Andres is introducing. So he's he's talking about he has he's had two different uh, situations uh, that involved of the, the intersection of police and and ICE. And this is this uh, or he's had past experiences with ICE. And in December he had a really bad incident that he's going to tell us about now. Ahora siga. Siga. Andres. Ok, eh, tuve una experiencia en el mes de diciembre que fui por, golpeado por un hombre eh, ruso. Eh, tuve mucho miedo de llamar a la policía debido a que ya me había acontecido que llamamos a la policía y, y llamaron a migración. Entonces estuve 
en coma, estuve en el hospital de Israel en Boston en situación de en coma y en este momento no han podido detectar las cámaras, ven el, el, la persona que me golpeó, pero no lo han podido eh, coger la persona y me siento muy indignado por eso. Um, he was in, 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 uh, in December, he, was, he had an incident where he was very severely beaten uh, by somebody and um, he actually was afraid to call the police because of his prior encounter where he, in another situation where he had called the police and uh, the police called ICE on him. And as a result, uh, he, at first he did, not want to, um, he did not want to call the police. Since then, he ended, up, uh, he ended up going to Beth Israel Hospital and he was hospitalized there for a long time. And they still haven't found the guy, which is uh, troubling to him as well. Yeah. Sí, entonces me siento un poco indignado a veces por eso, pero la lucha más grande que estoy haciendo por acá es por estar al lado de mi hija, que es la persona que yo más amo en mi vida. Y esa fue mi experiencia que fue un, muy fea para mí. Y mi esposa fue la que tuvo que llamar la policía porque yo sentía miedo de llamarla. He, uh, the, the most important thing for me right now is to stay with my daughter, whom I love dearly, and uh, it had it took it, it it had to be my wife who called the, the police because I was too afraid to call myself. Anyone? Yo yo creo que todo está muy bien. Solo quería dar mi opinión sobre los acontecimientos que me ha pasado. Les agradezco mucho por su atención. Thank you so much for um, your attention. Um, I just wanted you to know the kinds of things that happen. Muchas gracias, Andrés. Que Dios la bendiga a todos. God bless you all. Gracias, Andrés. De verdad, eh, también aplausos. Uh, let's, uh, you know, show support to Andrés. Um, gracias, Andrés, por, por ser lo suficientemente valiente de contar su testimonio. No es fácil. Y lamentamos lo que vivió. Thank you so much, Andres, for sharing your testimony. It's not easy. We understand you're brave enough to do it. And we definitely want to support you. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, ciao. Uh, now, please uh, welcome our next, next speaker, uh, a pastor whom we know uh, well at Alsa and respect a lot for her service and advocacy for our communities, Pastor Joanna Perez. Um, Thank you so much for being here tonight, and thank you uh, so much for making sure that the Hispanic Church is present in issues such as this. Um, welcome, Pastor Joanna. Pastora Joanna? Yes, I'm, un I'm muting myself. <laughs> okay, bienvenida, welcome. Hey. Uh, good evening, elected officials and community members. And thanks for the Community Act Coalition for hosting such an important conversation and allowing me to submit my testimony and, of course, my total support. My name is, uh, like you said, Maris Reverend Joanna Perez. I'm a senior pastor of Harvest Ministries and director of the Leadership uh, Education Program for Copani, which is a his, uh, Hispanic Pastoral Fellowship of New England. Uh, for over 30 years, I've had the privilege to work side by side with different spiritual leaders in our New England region. And now more than ever, I can say that I'm glad that we have nourished that um, fellowship throughout the years because it has become crucial at this very moment. As we have faced difficulties in this pandemic and started to hear about all the needs that people um, have, have um, such as food, diapers, toiletries, and so on, we encounter a, a, a dilemma, not new for us, but we encounter a dilemma. When we would tell people the places to go uh, that the cities would have available for them to actually go and get help, um, for, for some simple reason, they would answer like very simple, clear, said, no, we, I, I cannot go to those places. And we would ask them why. And the clear answer was, uh, no, they, they're going to ask me my name. They're going to ask me where I live. And, and so when I heard this, I 
went to all these other pastors that I have, uh, that we have in the fellowship and I asked them, what are you, how, how are you doing with all this um, that is happening? Uh, where are you sending your people? How are you doing to, to help them? And they surprisingly were telling me the same story. They will simply answer them. They will not go there. And that's why they were, you know, going towards us to look for help because they would not dare to um, even go to a food pantry. Something so simple as that, going to a food pantry because they needed food. Um, someone might say, uh, well, that's silly, you know. Uh, well, let me tell you, it, is that a constant state of being guarded, guarding yourself, it's a very real thing. It's a, that it's behind, it's a, it's, a, it's a psychological torture that we have to constantly be dealing with, with our people that are, are, are suffering because they don't feel safe by just looking to help um, in places. And so we, we encountered this very, very real need of people needing food and needing basic stuff but at the same time, not daring to even grab their car and go somewhere because the officials uh, were there. Um, and, and at one point they were saying, oh my goodness, if I go, I, I, I saw some army per, uh, people there and they're gonna call ICE and they're gonna, they're gonna let them know where I live. And no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to. And so it's very, very real and, and very sad at the same time. So when we encounter this challenge, we gather with pastors um, and, and community leaders and from Latinos and Brazilian churches and from Dorchester, Waltham, East Boston, Revere, Chelsea, uh, Lynn. Um, uh, and so we just together, we created um, with Alpha, who has been a great leader uh, to us and a lot of help. We started at home delivery food uh, relief um, idea and so we identify the people that needed this uh, and we for the past two months and a half we've been working side by side with uh, volunteers of the of the communities um, meeting the need where it is and this past uh, weekend we were able to give uh, deliveries to 869 homes different different people and their thank you, it's very, very touching. I've received even cakes of gratitude that they've given to the drivers to bring to us. Um, they have sent me texts, pictures, and, um, and it breaks my heart to see how real the fear is in their families. And, um, and you were saying that sometimes they don't even they don't even dare to even go for help, um, uh, medical help because they're afraid of giving information. And so that's why I'm giving a testimony. It's very real. It's very evident. But at the same time, uh, I'm so happy that we are part of this and we are supporting this bill. And I encourage everybody, everybody, get involved. Call your representatives. Call everybody that you can you know and let them know uh we need a change and the change cannot wait any longer and um and i want to thank all the volunteers that give a little bit of relief to all the people thank you thank you pastora perez thank you so much for your leadership in doing this too and you're right the fear is real, and that's why we need to pass Safe Communities Act now, so we can break that fear and develop the communication and trust between our community and other institutions. Thank you so much, Pastor uh, Perez. Um, so we're gonna move on. Uh, one of the reasons why COVID-19 has made this bill so urgent is that we've all seen immigrants be so afraid, as Pastora was saying, of being turned over to ICE, that they don't even want to get tested. Our next speaker has um, seen that fear firsthand, working as a contact tracer. Please welcome Tribini da Fonseca. Welcome. 
Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, and my name is Tabrini, and I'm very happy to be here tonight um, to show my, my support for the Safe Communities Act. I'm a student at Northeastern University, um, and for the last two months, I've worked as a contact tracer as part of the Massachusetts Community Tracing Collaborative. And though I've gone back to that, um, to my schoolwork, as part of my work as a contact tracer, I contacted individuals who had been, um, uh, who had tested positive for COVID-19 and their contacts um, to talk to them about the process of self-isolation, -isola quarantine, what that would mean, um, and to help them get the supports they needed in place to do so. And my team covered um, places with large immigrant communities like Everett, um, among other communities. And as many of, of us already know, and we talked about tonight, um, uh, Black and Hispanic communities in particular in Massachusetts have been disproportionately impacted and also nationwide um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen that um, a recent report by the pa Baker administration shows that for Hispanic residents, um, even though they make up 12% of the population, their rates of positive cases are 30%. And that's really concerning. Um, because of my language skills in Portuguese and Spanish, I was tasked with reaching out to those particular immigrant populations. And and it was very humbling to be dropping into people's lives during such a difficult and vulnerable moment um, and getting to know people, calling them every day to check in on how they were doing. It was also a really challenging experience because of the fear that we've talked about um, earlier today. It was not unusual for people to hang up the phone um, when I called for reasons, you know, such as fear of deportation, fear of the authorities, um, not really knowing, you know, where, where to get tested. And, you know, I would call multiple times um, in order to gain and build trust with people um, and to talk with them about that process. So, you know, I think these concerns around, you know, fear of authorities, fear of police, fear of, um, fear of going out are just so heightened during the time of this pandemic. And I can remember talking with one um, Spanish-speaking multi-generational family um, where grandparents, parents, adult siblings, and a couple of young children all live together, and multiple members were showing symptoms of COVID-19. Only one person had been tested in the family. And I spoke often with this family about getting to testing sites, but they were so worried about what it would cost, um, whether they could leave their home with people in their household who were undocumented, um, whether that information would get back to their employers or worse to immigration. And so for them, it just felt like it was better to not know at all. Um, they did all eventually get tested. They have all recovered since then. But what these stories show me and what the COVID-19 crisis has really shown us all is how interconnected and interdependent we are and that for us to build trust, immigrant communities need to feel respected, need to feel valued and part of our community. Um, so when we think about what it means to be a safe community, now more than ever, I think we need this foundation of trust, belonging, and welcoming. And so I really believe the safe, the safe Communities Act is critical to building that foundation of trust and ensuring the health of all of us. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it is absolutely true. The fear is real. Um, so uh, we, I know time is running, and I just want to introduce to you our last speaker. Um, our last speaker is a powerhouse in Massachusetts Haitian community, a pastor and advocate, leader of uh, the nonprofit True Alliance Center, which helps immigrants with education, housing, health, and much more, and a leader of Haitian Americans United. Please welcome Reverend Deerfort Fleurissant, or Great. better known as Pastor Kiki. I, am, I apologize for saying your name the wrong way, but I, I always have known you by Pastor Kiki, which is a lot easier. Welcome, Pastor. This is great. Uh, thank you so much. My mother gave me that name. She is still calling me Pastor Kiki. Thank you so much, Damaris, for the work that you are doing. Thank you uh, for the work of the coalition, the colossal work, and that's bring us uh, this far. I uh, want to thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, for providing for us on a daily basis and keeping us safe. And I pray that every one of you can remain safe until the storm pass over. As you know, the unequal conditions made by immigrants in the United States and Black Americans are unconscionable and have been amplified by the current moment. In such a time as this, 
So thank you, Rep. Miranda. Thank you, Rep. Tucker. Thank you, uh, uh, Rep. Barza, for standing uh, with us in this fight. And thank you, Senator Eldridge, uh, for your passion in helping immigrants uh, uh, living the quality of life they, would, they, would, they were expecting to be. So the question tonight is, what do you stand against and stand for? Do you take stand against racial injustice, prejudice, and inequality? Or would you stand for racial equity, equal rights and protection for all immigrants in the Commonwealth? In such time as this, this is an urgent hour of need. As Rep. Balser puts it, the hour is now to pass the Safe Communities Act. Just to give you an example, it was a January 6, 2019, a young man, he was 23 then in the church asking for prayer to be able to be faithful to God because he has a civil matter that he must go the next day, the next two days to court. And the fact that uh, his information was shared with ICE after leaving the civil court, he was apprehended by ICE. And he spent his, 24, uh, his 24th birthday in ICE custody. So we thank God it's only of, of just a few weeks ago that he was released. So meaning the Safe Community Act is urgent. It is crucial that we have this passed in the Commonwealth. Uh, also checking with the Haitian Women uh, Associations, always checking with them. They're telling me neighbors or children are calling for immigrant women that have been being abused because they are afraid to call the police. They've been told if they ever call the police, they'll have eyes deported them. So you can imagine that the fear that is permeated throughout the immigrant communities as well as in Haitian immigrants. So the Bible tells me, just me leave you with this one, at Proverbs 17, verse 22, a joyful heart, when a heart is joyful, that represents a good health. It is a good medicine. But when the heart is broken, when the heart is fearful, that's really drives up the bonds. That's bringing more virus to our community. So I urge all of you to stand with us, to stand with the Safe Communities Act Coalition, and to stand with all our elected officials. This year should be the year that we see victory for all immigrants, the passing of Safe Communities Act, and the passing of driver license in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you so very much, and may God bless you. Thank you very much, Pastor Kiki. What a good way to end up this uh, town hall. So that wraps up our program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all the panelists. But before you go, I want to ask you to do two things really quickly. Number one, if you haven't emailed your legislators about the Safe Communities Act in the past two months, do it now. You can do it now. You can use the link. Uh, on your screen or on the chat. I know they've been putting it um, constantly. Um, you're gonna see it. It's uh, bit.ly slash ma dash ska, S-C-A. It will take you two minutes. And every one of those emails gets read and counted. Believe me, they do. And number two, please share that link with someone you know who supports immigrants. Or maybe you can share it with 10, 20, or 50 people. The more, the better. We need advocates all across the state to get this bill passed. Enough is enough. The fear is real. The crisis is real. And we need your voice. We need your support. You have heard from many heroes who are in the front line, but we need you too. So please email your legislators, call them and say, the time is now to pass Safe Communities Act and start building that trust, that relationship that our community needs to have a better Massachusetts. Thank you so much for joining us, and we can't wait to see you again. <laughs>